Yeah. Um, I have a question for you all, if I if I might so, pose it about this. This is probably my one entry in your uh, you know Western series. I, I can't time travel back to last week. Uh, I don't think I'm I'm doing it next week. So I, I wanted to ask a a larger question about Westerns. This film made me think of right, and and you can correct me if my history on this is wrong, but. A lot of the classic Westerns leading up to the end of the West stuff, we're talking about an era that's like pre-capitalist. Like they're not doing capitalism in the traditional West. They're sort of settling, founding businesses, in, inventing law and ways of order. And I was thinking about a film and I might be getting this plot wrong. Austin will know because if anyone cares about this, some fun background info. Most of the foundational Westerns I ever watched were in an apartment with Austin and our friend John from Worcester, Mass, watching uh, the films of Sean Peckinpah. Shout, shout, yeah. shout out to John, yeah. And is it the Ballad of Cable Hogue where he finds water? Yeah, but then at the end, no one's stopping for water anymore because gas has emerged and people are driving on by? Yeah, that's right. Great. So like, so when I think about that movie, it's almost- It's one like, of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, it's a brilliant movie, um, and and a great example of Sam Peckinpah having a great sense of humor, where, where normally he just wants to watch, make you watch people die. Um, mm-hmm. But in that film, it's sort of like his Western story ends as industrialization, capitalism, automobiles, oil start rising. So it's almost like yeah. you can't have a Western in that context. And part of me thinks with this movie, what it had me thinking was like, if you take that Western um, framework and then you plop it in this moment, um, in a moment we could call the decline of capitalism, it, it's like the Western ends up being accidentally anti-capitalist. Because again, Taylor Sheridan is not out here with, with Mao's little red book in his pocket as he's as final draft open. Um, I don't think that's what he's trying to do, uh, but it kind of feels like classic Westerns were pre-capitalist and now we're seeing what happens when you put the same type of sort of motivation story plot stuff in the decline of capitalism, especially in those sort of Texas towns where the system isn't really working. Um, And and, and yeah, to to me, it kind of seems like we're getting this new, ah, I I, I guess like if the end of the West was initially the beginning of the financialization of the country, now with like the failure of that, with the mortgage system collapsing, all this sort of stuff, it almost provides this really nice, return for those western narratives Hmm. and if if that just was was nonsense you all can tell me and we can delete this no i I get what you're saying i think that i i and i wonder how much of it is is conscious or not i mean like you just kind of laid out perfectly there michael i think the the history of the western is like almost by necessity about the encroachment of capitalism at times like there are a lot of examples, you know, like Once Upon a Time in the West, another phenomenal Jason Robards movie is has a similar plot to it where there's uh, there's a homesteader who has discovered water in, in the middle of a vast expanse um, and is devising to build an entire town based around that discovery. Um, I think that uh, there's this this sort of. I wonder how much of it, though, is ideological versus aesthetic. Um, uh, it, what, I, what I'm trying to say is that, like, it, during during the sort of, like, fall of American empire, um, as I think well illustrated in this film, as, it, you know, the, the financial collapse being one of the major precipitating events to where we are today, uh, the, there is this sense of, like, well, as things just kind of hollow out and, and uh, you know, ghost towns pop up in a modern context, it's just one of those things of like, well, how, how else can you frame a story within, within that context that there, there is just sort of a, um, and I'm, I, I'm not saying this to rebuke anything you were saying. I, I'm just, I'm curious what you guys think. Rebuke Do you, away. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm curious what you guys yeah. think. Do you think it is? an ideological thing consciously or is it just like well no this, i don't think it's, it's conscious at all there's sort of yeah this sort of like yeah civilizational retraction that just leads to an it lends itself to a natural aesthetic idiom yeah i mean that would be my thought that it's not conscious but that it still emerges because of the mixture of that type of storytelling and that type of uh socioeconomic background i don't think it's consciously doing that but i think it ends up sort of unconsciously emerging or something like that. 
Austin, what, what, what do you think about my nonsense? Well, I, I, I think it's interesting. Um, I would say that if you look at a lot of the classic Westerns, a lot of them have to do with, like Raymond was just talking about, the discovery of a resource, which would then turn into the privatization of a resource, which then it would turn into the construction of, uh, of a town, which would then concern, uh, turn into like the production of this larger industrial setting that would feed into highways, that would connect with cities. So there's, there's clearly some sort of capitalist industry in its like burgeoning, maybe we would call it primitive accumulation um phases but there's also like um like you get this in in a lot of them where it's like you know cattle barons come in and they start fencing off the land and then the ranchers are like what the fuck you can't fence off the land like the land is common so there's the enclosure of the commons which is generally seen as one of the um narratival structures of the foundations of capitalism dating back to 17th 16th 17th century england right so so i've i've developed like in my own work which forthcoming in, in hopefully in a book here in the next year or so um where I, I call like the I'm, I'm looking at like what is like the essential logic of capitalism and the essential logic of finance in particular and i think there's at least one way we can look at it that it operates by like a threefold structure and what i call inscription enclosure and quantification and so inscription is the act of like meaning making right so let's take let's take once upon a time in the west and the discovery of water so uh the discovery of the water isn't the meaning making activity under capitalism it's when that meaning making activity turns the resource into a resource for a particular purpose right it is water for a town that's the first kind of moment right it as an instance right with with um with land it would be this is land that will be used for cattle farming or for cattle grazing right then there's the second step which is enclosure and enclosure is the act of incorporation or privatization and that's where you say oh we own this resource or this land is now the property of x group or corporation or something like that and then the third step is quantification and then that's when you basically can figure out how to um, turn this otherwise qualitative thing you know uh, water is good for survival into something that's water, water um, is worth X amount of dollars, right? So this threefold kind of this tripartite scheme is I think is a really good way to kind of understand it. And when we think about it in those terms, then we can look at a film like Logan even and we can say actually Logan is still about uh, inscription of DNA, uh, enclosure, privatization of it by that corporation and quantification the privatization uh, of that resource is now going to lead toward massive super profits for a particular corporation that's trying to colonize DNA. And that's what's being discussed in Logan is it isn't the uh, enclosure of land. It's the enclosure of another resource, which is information in the form of DNA, right? And so I think that all Westerns actually deal with this. And you get the same thing in Hell or High Water, but now it's the financialization of property of town or what sometimes is even referred to in the literature what's called like the anthropology of finance um what's called like these the uh, financialization of everyday life right which is that every aspect of your life where you live how you live where are you going to go eat how are you going to eat what are the relationships that we exchange with each other are they going to be debt relationships you know is it going to be like i give to you therefore you owe me back plus interest i mean whatever these sorts of frames of thinking can can be related to this tendency at the economic level of financialization but it translates into kind of like much deeper social aspects and i think in that sense this film is actually not post-capitalist in any way but it's actually thoroughly capitalist in the sense that it's maybe even like the most potent form of capitalism the most kind of like radical and extreme and efficient form of capitalism <laughs> that has presented itself in this film is like ah and here are the tensions and then if i can just loop this around the last thing i'll say what this ties into then is the construction of the outlaw the outlaw in the form of a bank robber has always existed which is the person living outside against those that tripartite model of um of inscription enclosure and quantification and they're trying to do something different right um or uh in the case of like uh john wayne or shane where they're fighting against the robber barons or i'm sorry the cattle barons or something like that right it's it's them kind of trying to kind of rest aside the local like take the local back from the evil big corporation right and then in this one you kind of get something similar you get them coming up with a clever scheme whereby the bank that is extracting uh, hyper profits actually becomes the ones that service their own debt, 
right? And so it's the same yeah. kind of thing. It's just got these different kind of nuances to it. And I think I think there's a real consistency here from the old classical westerns all the way up through kind of like the neo and post yeah. post post westerns. The, the outlaw being a side effect of enclosure, essentially. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm, so ah. th this is something that I uh, I kind of alluded to in my opening thoughts and, and you bringing up uh, the bank and kind of landing on that note. Um, I wanted I, I wanted to touch on something with regards to the script in this film. And it's going to sound like a criticism, but it really isn't. Um, I, I mentioned the stagecoach rule um, uh, on the last episode or two, Austin, the the. Uh, mm -hmm. The John Ford movie, the the notion of you know why why don't the Native Americans shoot at the at the horses instead of at the stagecoach? Well, because then there'd be no movie. Right, right, right. So there is the stagecoach rule is very much in effect in Hell or High Water, because these guys could go to literally any bank in Texas, any other non Texas Midlands bank. <laughs> explain the situation to them say like we need to pay off this mortgage and a bunch of like back payments or whatever and we'll be able to make you whole 10 times over with just a month of pumping out the oil that's that's uh uh speculators have told us is underneath our land they could just explain this to literally any bank in in the state or i dare say in the country but we're assuming they would, they would know to do that and think to do that I'm not, I'm not saying that they would know to do that yeah. or that they would think to do that. Like I said, this is going to sound like a criticism. Yeah. But I think even if they do think to do that, and it, it, once again, then there'd be no movie. It certainly wouldn't be as exciting as this movie is, it, just them signing a bunch of paperwork with a different bank to, to trade over the lease. But one of the things that I, I wanted to touch on with this is that I think it stands in stark contrast to something like Little Miss Sunshine, which we recently discussed, where the entire narrative of that film is built on a similarly very shaky uh, sort of premise. Um, but I think the reason it works in this film, as opposed to Little Miss Sunshine, is that notion of like cinematic or ecstatic truth that like... We've mm. talked a lot about the sort of visual vocabulary of a Western, the the sort of idiom with which within which these characters are not only are painted, but in which they perceive themselves. There is this notion when I watch it, at least, that Michael, they very well may have thought of that. But either Ben Foster talked to Chris Pine out of it or Ben Foster thought of it and never told Chris Pine because he still wants to get his rocks off. So there, it's just one of those things I, I kind of wanted to throw uh, your way, uh, gentlemen, and just kind of see what you what you think about that when not necessarily just in this movie, but when you watch a movie that is built on a really shaky premise that could be resolved very easily without any conflict, drama or death. Um, what What is the thing that makes you go along with the movie or what's the thing that kind of takes you out of it? Yeah. Michael, what do you think? Well, I mean, I, I, just narrative wise, and maybe it's because I have dumb baby brain, but I just loved how neatly it wrapped up where <laughs> they took the money from the bank to pay off the mortgage to that bank to set up a trust with that bank to then include that bank on the oil money so that also that bank would have no reason to further inquire uh, upon yeah. Uh, Chris Pine's complicity, which I did think that was the most interesting thing. Not the most interesting thing, but I like that last conversation that Jeff Bridges has with his replacement, where she basically is like, the bank doesn't care. They stole $40,000 from the bank. They're making that off these guys every week now, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I enjoyed that so much that it doesn't bother me, but I do, I, I, I definitely get what you're saying there. Right. No, I'm not saying it bothers me. I'm just, I'm, I, no, I just you said the script is bad and that you would physically <laughs> fight Taylor Sheridan in any field. Um, no, the reason, the north reason, of the Rio Grande, the reason I bring it up is to reiterate. I think there is, there are times at which you can just claim the stagecoach rule and just say, well, there'd be no movie. And I think this is the kind of movie that's worth it to sort of fudge the numbers around the margins a little bit and, and buy into this premise that otherwise could be very easily resolved. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the the reason that it's successful and that it works is because of the the kind of polarities that you get that are always just appealing to people. Like, so if you have like the the kind of straight man and the wild man, like that's just something that automatically and that's set up from the very beginning as soon as that opening 
um, that opening bank robbery scene happens. And I think that's the other thing too, is I, my, my partner, she looked at me and she was kind of like, Oh, like, is this going to be like a fucking violent shoot him in the head? She's like, are they going to kill that woman? Like, and that's not her favorite style of movie. So for her, it was kind of a, and then about halfway, three quarters through, she was like, I fucking love this movie. She got so into it. So there was something about even just these these relationship dramas that deepen and deepen and deepen because it isn't until halfway through that you actually understand why they're doing what they're doing, right? You kind of just, okay, they're doing something. Are they just bad guys? Are they just like tweakers as uh, as as Alberto keeps saying? Yeah. You know, you're like, what the fuck is their deal? And then you're like, nah, Chris Pine, he's got his shit together too much. He's, he's, not, a, he's not just doing it for chaotic reasons. There's a reason here, right? And then you're like, oh, it's curious that they're only going Texas Midlands. And then you're like, oh, wait, is it because the cameras are out? So they use a lot of like little kind of fabrications of drama to keep you invested i think just like little things here you're like oh so they're doing the texas midlands ones because the cameras are being switched out so they just must know this because maybe one of them works at at, at texas midlands bank or or they have some sort of in there somehow right and so you're thinking so there's just these like little ways to lead you maybe i mean i know that that's kind of like a really kind of superficial answer for it i think but i think that's one of the reasons why they're able to get away with it and why it works why you don't have a moment where you stop and you say i could get off here if they just did this right it's only in reflection later that you say it because i think the flow is so good that it just kind of keeps you keeps you giving you what you want before you even know that you want it sort of thing for me it, it always just comes down to that like emotional honesty that i think these characters could come off as very archetypal um and it's a credit not only to mm. uh, i think a very good script but also wonderful performances um i would say all around it's a wonderful ensemble but this is something that you touched on a little bit with uh, our discussion of the writer austin um sort of uh, with regards to blending the line between uh narrative and documentary fact fiction um, and you went on this big rant about how there is no objective truth within narrative. Um, and, you know, I, I understood where you, what you were saying with that and, and where you were going with that. And I, I think that uh, I think it's Werner Herzog who talks about this notion of ecstatic truth that mm. you know obviously everything is to, to paraphrase what you were saying last week it's a matter of you know where the camera's being placed whose perspective the story is from you know why, why do they cut here as opposed to there etc um and i i do think there is something to be said about a movie like this where you you really feel for these guys and there mm. is there is this beautiful ecstatic cinematic truth that takes you along on this journey without um like you said having to stop at any point and be like eh, but this doesn't make any sense well because this is what they need to do to have the movie be interesting <laughs> yeah and and remember how i said at the beginning i was like I, I like collect these like you know what do you call for lack of a better word like masculine poetry or like dude poetry things um the reason also like like for me somebody like like a film like um like badlands or days of heaven kind of fits that with terrence malick he was he was doing a sort of like like cowboy poetry with those films this film i feel like the cinematography also lends itself to this sort of longing right and maybe this is partly because of the authenticity of the characters and the performances that are turned in the relationships that are built the fact that we really start to become invested in the circumstances that are driving them but also there's this backdrop of destitution and desert towns and and it made me feel like there's a town here in australia i won't name it because i don't want to like talk shit about it because i'll probably go back there at some point soon but we were driving through it on a recent road trip and my partner was like oh my god i feel like we're in the middle of like like nowhere america and i was like yeah i feel like there's like a town in like oklahoma or something that has been deserted huge just huge wide streets you know and like no cars and like storefronts that were built in like the 40s and like most of them are closed down now and i i i just i get this i don't know it stirs something in me that is at once nostalgic for a time past and then also heartbroken and tragic for the fact that that time that maybe was once thriving or that was at once that they believed that they were on a path towards progress or towards prosperity or towards happiness or peace or whatever and that it's no longer there for them that 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 age has been subsumed under something else and so there's this this tragedy and and this hopefulness that's kind of all complicating each other and then there are just some shots like there's a shot where 
Um, it's it's a, a landscape. Well, no, it's like, it's like a wide shot where you've got Ben Foster leaning up against the pole, drinking a beer. You got Chris Pine just a little off center frame, sitting on the bed of his truck, and they're talking. And then the the ranch is in the background, and there's a little bit of barbed wire in the foreground. And then you've just got this land, this this like expanse in the background. And the, and I'm like, that's a fu- that's like that's a every frame a painting. That is a painting. <laughs> And I was like, that is so beautiful. And it just gives you everything you need to know about who they are. Uh, Foster, the way he's leaning, drinking his beer. Pine, sitting there pensive in the center of the screen. The ranch in the background. This beautiful backdrop of Texas. It just gives you everything you need to know in one visual image. And I think that's really great storytelling. And when you have those things, it gets you. And if you're if you're not paying attention to it, it still lands on you unconsciously. And if you are paying attention to it, then it gives you like this real rational meat to really chew on. And, and I think this film does that very well. Oh, that was really well put. Yeah, I would agree. Oh, and I, yeah. I think uh, every, <laughs> I got nothing else bad. <laughs> no, I, I, all, all I was going to say is that everything you were saying um, uh, about what that drive through Australia sort of evoked in you, Austin, I, I think ties quite neatly into what Michael was saying about the sort of uh, retraction of civilization uh, against which this film is set. Yeah. And it's too bad we don't have too much time. We got to kind of wrap it up here. But I'd love to also just at least put this out there for people to think about how that that speech. That I- hey, guys, if you want to hear the rest of the conversation, make sure to find us on your podcast application of choice. And if you want to support Show Me the Meaning or Culture Binge, subscribe and then rate and review on Apple Podcast. Thanks, as always, for watching. I'll catch you later.